Well, it's my privilege this morning to introduce to you Amy Butler, who is our guest preacher today. And uh, some of you may know of Amy uh, along the way. I know there have been some connections with a few folks from uh, previous places where she has served. Uh, Amy is, uh, grew up in Hawaii, as you can read in your order of service in the, uh, the, the bio that's there. Uh, now serves as pastor of the Riverside Church in New York City. Uh, Prior to that was at Calvary Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and uh, even though she lives in New York and uh, hails from Hawaii, she has spent some obligatory time in Texas. Uh, all good people do, right? <laughs> uh, well, a Amy, as we have a, a, a little opportunity to get to know you better here. Tell us about the Riverside Church. I think a lot of folks here know about the church, but maybe don't know a lot about the church. And some of us have been there, but maybe not most. Sure, Mark. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me here at Wilshire. It's an honor and pleasure to be with you. Um, how many of you have been to the Riverside Church in the city of New York? A few of you. Okay, so you might already know the church was founded in the 1930s by John Rockefeller, and it is the tallest church in America. And I was telling Mark that my office is on the top floor, which in effect makes me the closest pastor to God in all of America. <laughs> John Rockefeller wanted to uh, build a cathedral where people, Christian people of all different denominations could come and worship together. Um, with a sense of unity and grandeur, and it certainly is a beautiful place. And over this last century, um, some of my predecessors, um, notably Harry Emerson Fosdick and Bill Coffin and Jim Forbes, have been um, prophetic preachers of the gospel and have um, set um, a prophetic stance for the Christian church in America. And so I am um, the seventh senior minister of the Riverside Church and the first woman. Okay, well, uh, blazing new trails there in New York City, uh, but that's a good segue to the next question I wanted to ask you, and that is, uh, as uh, a woman who is a pastor, uh, we, this is a congregation that cares deeply about opportunities for women in ministry, and we know that uh, what becomes old hat to us is not old hat everywhere else. What is your, uh, from that lofty office looking over Manhattan uh, there, what is your perception uh, or perspective on opportunities for women in ministry today? Well, I'd l I'm so happy to have this opportunity to say thank you to you, Wilshire, because in the Baptist world there are some congregations who have really been uh, open and supportive um, to encourage women in the call to pastoral ministry. You know, I didn't grow up a Baptist, but one of the things that drew me to uh, being a Baptist was that idea that God's Spirit shows up and works in mysterious ways that we can't always predict. And I always thought, well, great, I'll be a pastor then. You know, I couldn't figure out why everyone was so upset about it. But anyway. <laughs> So I had been pastor of uh, Calvary Baptist Church for 11 years and had just, you know, it had become old hat. And you were the first female pastor there as well, right? Right. But they, they never introduced me as, you know, this is my girl pastor, oh. you know. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, I was, I was the pastor, the pastor, pastor. So when I, I, I came to the Riverside Church, it was kind of puzzling to me that so many news outlets wanted to write about the fact that I'm a woman. And it was a little tedious to be honest. Um, but that changed for me when I got an email from a young woman in Oklahoma who said that she had graduated from seminary and been looking for a job for a year and a half. And it was her first Sunday preaching in her first church when one of the older men in the congregation came up to her and handed her a clipping from the New York Times announcing my call to the Riverside Church. And she said in her email, he knew that I knew this news. Of course I knew this news. When he gave me that clipping, it was his blessing on my ministry. And so in that moment, I took a step back and I realized again that it's important for churches that um, nurture and cultivate the gifts in, in diverse expressions to step forward and to keep doing what you do. So thank you. So now we all know that when George comes back and you're introducing him to someone in the future, 
we can introduce him. Here is my male pastor, yes. George Mason. <laughs> please, intro. just please do that one. <laughs> Uh, well, Amy, I know that one of the hallmarks of Riverside Church through the years has been a commitment to justice issues, and uh, it seems to me that you landed uh, in that place in New York City uh, at a time that a lot was swirling around on opportunities to address this. What, what is the role of the church, uh, in your view, on addressing the cultural, social uh, justice issues, particularly in these times we find ourselves now? Well, you can imagine what it's like to follow two African-American ministers and to become the pastor of an African-American church when I am not only a woman, but also, even though I'm a native Hawaiian, um, I'm perceived as white. And it is no small thing to step into the pulpit where Martin Luther King Jr. preached seven times and Nelson Mandela preached and so many um, bastions of social justice in our time, and particularly in this year when our country has been in so much turmoil and pain over broken systems and racism all around us. And so this has been a question I've asked myself a lot and asked my people, you know, what does the church have to say for the brokenness of our time? It's an important, important question that um, congregations need to be asking, we need to be asking ourselves, and we need to be showing up in these conversations so that we show the world around us that the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to bear very powerfully on all of these issues of injustice in our communities. So you have an opportunity through a prominent pulpit to explain this, but there's more to it than just simply saying it. What are some ways that your congregation and or others should be involved in addressing these? Well, I've only been there a year, so I haven't fixed all of the problems in society yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you had Manhattan under control. <laughs> no, I think, you know, it's important what, what we preach from the pulpit. It's very important what our people do around organizing, around social services and social justice, around showing up to be the voice of the gospel in places where the church doesn't often show up. Um, but it also, um, you know, it also is incumbent upon us to lead the world in being a prophetic voice for uh, reconciliation and justice and peace and for modeling for the world around us that we can be a community, a beloved community that reflects uh, the powerful gospel message. Well, Amy, it's a delight to have you with us today. We we'll look forward to your message. Thank you for sharing yourself with us today.